I think we have more people than registered, so we could wait. Okay. Well, what time does it say? My watch is always on. It says now. We can yep. start any time. It's up to you. Let's go for it. All righty. I'll get started. <laughs> Uh, where's our little doohickey? You got the doohickey? Yep. Okay. Welcome to the 420 session at the, which day is it? Are we the Embedded Linux day or the Open IoT day? Or are they all the same day? It's all the same. Okay. Welcome to our talk on prototyping with the ESP32. I'm Ivan Judson and my colleague Pamela Cortez. Uh, to give you a little bit of context about what we're talking about, who we are and what's going on, uh, I am a sort of career academic who's gone into the commercial world. I have been three years at Microsoft at a startup before that. And in my role at Microsoft, I helped sort of get our hands wrapped around partner opportunities in IoT, working with the Aldrin Foundation Framework Consortium. And then uh, rolled into a bunch of open IoT events, uh, being involved here. I have a little bit of experience all over the place, but what I've done at Microsoft over the last couple of years is really engage in customer problems around IoT. And then uh, more recently, I have taken all of that and rolled it up and I've moved over into the product side. So I'm working in our Azure IoT product team. And I am specifically tasked with working on the Microsoft Connected Vehicle Platform, which we announced at CES this year. Um, with a whole bunch of details left unanswered intentionally. Um, and I have been working, I'm sure there's other things that we were gonna talk about, but uh, I have been working with, the, with Espressif and the ESP8266 and now the 32 for about a year, building various ideas and products. Um, and I have a, a little bit of a startup passion. So I've been advocating these devices in various scenarios. So I'll let Pamela introduce herself, talk a little bit about what she does. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, so my name is Pamela Cortez. Uh, before Microsoft, I worked at SparkFun Electronics in the engineering department. So I did anywhere from hardware engineering to their software league, and then anywhere from making a tweeting turkey to playing office pranks to robotics um, and going out and teaching as well. Uh, so I'm interested. Um, your guys' background, are you guys mostly embedded Linux? Who's the? Embedded folks, okay. And then who are the folks where they're focused on the cloud side of IoT? Everything, both. A few, a few <laughs> Raise hands, you. I love it. All yeah. the end-to-end -end IoT solution. So we, we like to think of this more of a, like a chalk talk where it's very interactive. So if you have any questions, let us know and, and just interrupt us. And if you have anything that, um, uh, experience in some of our products or some of the open source uh, uh, commits that we've done and would say you have positive or negative feedback, feel free to give it to us because we want to hear it as well. So I'm going to get started on really what the agenda is going to be for this, uh, for this talk. So we're going to be talking about the prototyping process and really high level on that. And then we're going to talk about the ESP32 background and who in here has worked with the ESP8266? So we got you, who's already worked on the ESP32? Great, great. So uh, that gives me a little bit more context. So I could talk a little bit more about what is the ESP8266 and ESP32. All right, and then we're going to talk about Azure. And then Ivan's going to do an ESP32 demo. All right, so I'm going to talk really high level on the prototyping process for IoT devices. So first step, number one, is come up with that new idea. So anywhere from, let's say you have an idea for a streaming device uh, for home automation, or maybe you're just copying Alexa um, and deciding to make you know, your own, own device, uh, you, just starting off with an idea and what you want for your product. The next step is actually thinking about the requirements. So for example, what's it gonna do? Do you wanna stream video? Do you wanna you know, stream audio or none of the above? Or maybe, you know, maybe the attendant use of it is you know, being able to uh, have a home automation device. 
But sometimes you have to think about the real life use, because sometimes people will take your product and totally use it for the different use case, uh, which we see all the time, or even uh, hack it as well, which I believe is the fun part. But if you're, if you're trying to have a product in the consumer side, you don't want anyone being able to hack your product, of course. And then doing market research. So if you know, you're going to do this product that I just described, uh, and there's already 50 other companies doing it, is that something that you want to do? Or what is, the dif what is the difference between your product versus other products? And then device selection. So budget is a real big thing, especially when I was doing hardware engineering. We thought about the bill of material all the time. Um, and the, the, most re the reason for that is because if we're building a cheap Wi-Fi solution and our bomb, our bill of materials is like $70 and we have uh, our margins need to be at you know, 4x, there's no way that we could actually be competitive in that market. So budget is actually a really big topic for engineers. And then uh, device life cycle too. Is this something that's gonna be out in the field for 15, 20 plus years? Or is this something that you think is going to last you know, for the five, five years? So something to think about. And then, of course, uh, how you connect to it. So a big topic right now is remote monitoring in places where there's no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you connect? Is it through gateways, you know, seller modules? So that whole methodology of how you design devices is very different than de uh, designing consumer devices. And then also for uh, device selection, you got to think of... Uh, products that are going to be end of life. So if you got a really great deal on a microcontroller from eBay <laughs> and uh, you're thinking it's, oh, that's great, and then your product gets big, uh, there's going to be, you know, you're going to learn, you're going to have some tough learnings from that, especially if you want to have millions of devices and you find out you can no longer use that chipset, mostly because it's end of life. So things like that. And then product life cycle. Development testing, device management, uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, great headway in device management. How you do over-the-air updates with firmware is a big topic, especially for security as well. Being able to patch those devices if someone does get hold of those devices is something to pay attention to. Uh, and then also product support. So if you have a, a product, let's say, we'll, we'll go back to Alexa because it's a really popular IoT product at the moment, um, one of the things to, or the echo, one of the things to think about is what type of technical support you're going to have for that. Because there's going to be a lot of beginners using the, the echo. So you want to be able to sure that you have enough customer service representatives. And then if you have developers hacking with that project or that product, you need to be able to have the staffing for that as well. So that's super high level, and it's really going to set us up for the rest of the, the talk. So some of the, the actual devices that we have SDKs with and support for, and a lot of our de device SDKs, Ivan will talk to at the end of the, in, end of the talk as well. So I have anywhere from the ESP8266 to um, Raspberry Pis, Edison's. Uh, one of the things to think about between microcontrollers and microprocessors, microcontrollers are really good at ingesting data and sending it to the cloud, doing really simple things. Uh, and the microprocessors are really good for, let's say you want something where you're doing compute on the edge. So you want to do something that you have all this amount of data, but you don't want to send all the data straight up to the cloud. Uh, you can do some of, some of the you know, analytics right on the device side and send what you need to send up to the cloud. And the reason for that is a huge cost savings. So it really depends on what type of scenario that you want to do. So let me know if you guys have any questions, but I'm going to skip, skip ahead. Uh, so why Expressive? Why are we here talking about it? Uh, and why Microsoft is putting an interest in it? Uh, mostly because it's a low cost uh, chipset, which is made by Expressive Systems. Uh, it's ideally under $20 for a dev board and easy to get started for. And also, it crosses between the maker community, beginners, and then also startups and you know, R&D research and 
to production. So you can actually go from prototyping to production really easily. Unlike some of the products in the maker community, uh, some of them are great for prototyping, but when you go to production, you'll find out that there's not that support for it or it's hard to scale up with some of those, some, some of those products. And then also, there's fast and adoption by you know, SparkFun, Adafruit, and many others using this chipset, which is great. Uh, because it, it will help beginners out who want to, you know, they're influencers in the communities, but maybe they don't know how to start get, getting started with hardware. It's easy for them to prototype their idea, bring it to an investor, and then be able to build up a team behind that idea as well. And then, I forgot to mention that Expresso was named the cool vendor uh, in IoT in 2016 by Gardner. And Gardner is really that gold standard of, you know, who are the leaders in IoT. And they say cool vendor, but it really means that they're the most innovative vendor at this moment. And it's mostly due to their open source community support. This is really taking off in the community. So let's say you are a maker who wanted to, you know, make a smart light bulb or a connected device or a connected appliance, you can actually do that really easily because there's such a huge community who's willing to help you out and open source code behind it as well. All right. I was going to jump in one yeah, second go ahead. and say, um, for those of you who've worked with any of the Espresso chips ups in the past, the 8266 development environment was not entirely open. Um, there were, most of it was, but some of the actual uh, libraries, Espresso had built and distributed binary because of whatever management they had been going through. But in that process and by working with them over the last couple of years, for the ESP32 in particular, it is entirely open. The entire tool set, the entire the source for everything. So you can, you can basically start from a piece of, you know, a, a board and an editor and run, uh, build and run your app in minutes. It's a pretty straightforward process. And, I think that they understand that they are in the hardware innovation business and leveraging communities, the open source and open tools from the community accelerates their business as well as everyone else's. And so they really do get that sort of model. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And they're really good at building up that community as well. All right, and why the ESP32? So the ESP32 is, you can use it for many different applications. Anywhere from wearables, connected appliances, to streaming audio and video players, uh, and even uh, uh, connective, uh, oh, I already mentioned connected appliances and home automation. So another thing is it has 12 years of committed expressive support, which is huge, especially when you Make a, make a product, you want to make sure that that product has support for a long time. And they're guaranteeing 12, even 20 years of device lifespan, which is really great, especially when it's going out in the field. Because a lot of the um, products that do go out in uh, commercial um, enterprise scenarios do stay in the field for a really long time. And then also, it's mobile factors depending on your product requirements. So you can really just have it simply adjusting, um, ingesting data straight to the cloud, or you could do stuff with that data before it goes to the cloud. So it's, it's really versatile. So it comes in many different form factors to get started with. Uh, here's a couple. So this one's their dev board. Uh, if you breadboard before, it, it nicely fits it's right into a breadboard. It's, you can connect it with jumper wires, really easy to get started with, great documentation. And then the next one is the, the rover board. It has an LCD in the back and then extra components as well. Uh, what's great about this one, you can stream audio, you can do video. And so that's a great way of getting started without connecting a bunch of shields and everything with it. And then on top of it, you know, Adafruit and SparkFun, they're already making boards, uh, development boards and shields for this product as well. So if you're a fan of their company, uh, you can work with, work with their past shields that were being used for the ESP8266. How, how many of you are familiar, before you move off the slide, how many of you are familiar with the difference in the, the board versus the dev board versus the shield? Okay, so I just want to point out in this picture, the ESP32 is actually only that part of the picture. 
It's this square here. The rest of this is their dev board, so it's mounted to expose all the interfaces on the, on the 32. And it has some LEDs and buttons for resetting and firmware. And it actually has a uh, UART serial blah, blah, blah. I can plug into my USB port without an adapter. Which is really nice. Makes my life happy. Yeah. <laughs> Instead yeah, of having FTDI, an extra. <laughs> yeah, FTDI interface, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, because a lot so. of dev boards, you have to have the FTI basic to connect with it and yeah. extra boards. So it's, I mean, it's, a, it's the full <laughs> package and you have to add sensors to it, but it's still nice to get started with. So we're gonna. <laughs> of course we lose this yeah. <laughs> So the ESP8266 uh, versus the ESP32. So the 8266 came first um, and it's a Wi-Fi chip. <laughs> Ooh, thanks for helping. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this one is based on the Tencelica. It's a 32-bit uh, microcontroller. And then the ESP32 is still Tencelica, but it's a dual core LX6 microcontroller. And the reason why I wanted to mention that is because this company, the Tencelica, is actually, uh, we're using HoloLens uh, and their technology in our HoloLens device. So little little tidbit there. And then uh, some other things are that the operating voltage and the operating temperature is the same between both chipsets. And then for the ESP32, it has both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So something to think about is that the ESP32 is not a complete replacement of the 8266 because there's applications where you don't need that Bluetooth. So if you don't need the Bluetooth, why spend more on your bill of materials to get that feature. So something to think about if you're, you're de uh, deciding if you're gonna use it for your product or not. So the sensors, the ESP8266 doesn't have any sensors included. Uh, so that, that's probably good if you just want a really basic microcontroller. And then the 32 has a hall sensor, capacitive touch, uh, ultra low noise analog amplifier, which is really nice. So a couple different sensors you can use. And for GPIO pins, the 8266 has 17 pins, and then the ESP32 has 32 pins. So there's a lot more uh, pins that you can work with, but then again, it goes back to, do you really need 32 GPIO pins for your application? And then I, I'm gonna tell you right now, I haven't done an application where I needed that many, but uh, it could be very useful depending on what scenario you're using. For security, the jump from 8266 to 32, there's a lot more security features for the 32. They've done a lot of really great innovative updates to security. That doesn't mean that the 8266 isn't secure. It just means that the 32 with the Bluetooth support and Wi-Fi combined, they also have even more uh, security features. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Excuse me? How many bit curve? I don't remember off the top of our head. We can look at the specs. It's, um, one of the things yeah, that's in, interesting in terms of the extra features we don't have in the table, that I don't think we talk about them later in the slides, is that uh, the ESP32 actually has the notion of doing secure firmware. Mm -hmm. So it has uh, memory protection that if you mess with it, it'll erase itself. And it also has the ability mm -hmm. to encrypt the flash and the bootloader. Um, we don't do that in our, in our demo because once you encrypt, then the process is longer for doing all the updates. You can't really do over the air yet with that way. And so we're not demoing any of that, but it has significant more security features as a, as a IoT edge device mm -hmm. that you want to put in a place where it may get tampered with and you want to be able to trust it. So. Yeah. Thanks, Ivan. And then for power consumption modes, we like to always point that out because battery uh, management and um, power consumption is a huge topic for IoT. So for the 8266 versus the 32, things to keep in mind that is the battery management, the power modes, are a lot better with the, the, the 32. However, there's also a lot more modes in the 32 that you could change for. Uh, so if you have any questions for that, let me know. Uh, and then there's also 
sometimes that the power consumption is going to be more for the 32, it's mostly because you're doing more with the chipset, the microcontroller in this scenario. Yeah, one, one detail in that that's useful is even in low power mode with the 32, there is an ultra low power coprocessor mm -hmm. that can be woken up and used. And so there's actually like, I want to say, eight different power modes in the 32. So in this table, we just tried to match up the most sort of the closest corresponding modes. Yeah. yeah. Hibernation is the lowest state that they document. Yeah. yeah. This is so it's not a this is literally powered off. It's mm -hmm. still consuming. That one, it doesn't uh, have a powered off state. Yeah. So it's not a direct comparison when you get to the last numbers from off and hibernation. Yeah. All right. So Microsoft Expressive, Adafruit, and, and SparkFun. So we've had a really strong partnership with Expressive and also the, the maker companies as well. And the, the biggest thing that we take away from that is that we want to be able to contribute to Expressive's ecosystem so and make sure that it's able to connect to Azure right out of the box. Uh, it'll make it a lot easier for developers to get started with. And then we've also been working with Adafruit to create you know, the 8266 kits so for people can breadboard, different sensors like temperature, humidity, and really get started to see what you could do with the, the 8266. Other thing with that is that you could use the Arduino IDE, but you can also use the native um, C SDK as well, which I really recommend, especially if you're go thinking about going into production. But if you're you know, a maker or someone who wants to get started with it, um, and you're comfortable with Arduino IDE, there's full support for that as well. And you're seeing it with the ESP32 that's coming out for Arduino support. So that kind of just is what the kit looks like. All the code is you know, open source, so it's the hardware, it's easy to get started. Wait, go back to the point yeah. a second. I just want to point out, if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, okay. this kit we put together with one of our partners. Adafruit. Like. Adafruit. Yeah. Um, and this, I think, retails for forty six ninety five, mm -hmm. about fifty dollars, and it has all these components. This, the rover board, retails for about the same price, mm -hmm. just about the same price. It has many of the same sensors, but not all of them. It has an LCD, which that doesn't have. And having given hundreds of hours of tutorials on IoT, I would rather carry these around and help people learn how to write software then match up pins to holes. Yeah. There's a big value to integrated. Yeah, and LCDs <laughs> are not cheap either. So they definitely got a really great deal on that dev board. No, I totally agree. And if you're not familiar with breadboarding and you're just starting, uh, it could be kind of a little intimidating for people as well. So as I mentioned, you know, we have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and power management for the ESP32, and, and the, here's the pinouts, uh, the 30, 32 GPIO pins. So I'm going to let Ivan take over and talk about the, the cloud side and the full end-to-end -end IoT solution. Well, let's see how it goes. How, how many of you have built IoT solutions with the cloud, going to the cloud? Uh, about a quarter of you. How many of you have used Microsoft's cloud at all? Azure? OK. A different quarter of you. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. I'm going to give a, sort of a, a very quick overview of what we provide in Azure, but mostly from the point of view of an IoT, trying to, uh, trying to build something in the IoT space and have an end-to-end -end solution that, that delivers some value not just to the customer, but also to you, because no one gets into the business of doing IoT just for fun. Right? Go ahead. So Uh, we'll get to that. That's part of our demo. Excellent question. But you're setting me up, and I'm not ready yet. <laughs> where we didn't plant him. <laughs> yeah. We'll pay him later, but we didn't plant it. Um, so this is generally the way we think about uh, IoT in the big picture. And, and what you should notice here is this big bar in the middle is essentially where the cloud starts from the client point of view. This is, this, from here to the right, is infrastructure that you would outsource to an, a cloud provider. 
Microsoft, Google, Amazon, whomever, and we would all provide functionally the same kind of solutions. We would provide what we call batch analytics, hot path analytics, and hot path business logic. Business logic is things like real-time uh, uh, ap applications that trigger on the data coming in. So logic applications, Lambda, um, and we use actor frameworks, so we're monitoring things in real time. Uh, hot path analytics are more things where you're gonna process the data as it's coming in and do some interesting things on it. Sliding window averages, aggregations, things like that. And then batch analytics is more where you're gonna do, try to extract insight and knowledge from the data that you're acquiring. This isn't something you're gonna do every minute, every hour, but you might do it daily, weekly, monthly. It's places where you would apply technology like Hadoop or Spark to process large quantities of data. Or uh, in our case, we have things like Azure ML, where you can build machine learning models and then execute them on the data as it flows in. You need that large quantity of data to train your model, and then you can run your model as either hot path analytics or a logic app. Tell me when an anomaly is happening with my devices so that I can notify someone to go out there and repair it. That kind of stuff. Um, we have a bunch of infrastructure in, the, in these places that's Microsoft specific, and so does every cloud provider. The, point, the only point I want to make about this side is that one of the things we have worked very hard at over the last few years is to make sure that you can bring your existing expertise and add the value to this side of the pie with the tools and technologies you're familiar with. So you can write node-based applications, Python. You can still do C-sharp and various other Microsoft technologies, but you can do it with essentially anything. Our Spark implementation is Python native, so we're not doing anything sort of strange in that space. Um, so that's kind of all the stuff that happens in the cloud. This cloud gateway, this is an old slide. This is now, if, we, if I were to make up, if I had gone and found the newer slide, this would say IoT Hub. IoT Hub is the cloud endpoint for IoT devices in the Microsoft ecosystem. IoT Hub provides large-scale telemetry ingestion as well as command and control out to devices. We have documented plans for device management, software management, and various other components that are going out to the device. Um, I don't know where we are in the delivery of those plans, and I'm inside the product team, so I'm trying to be very careful about not saying anything I'm not supposed to. We did um, release uh, the device management and twins, methods, roots, all of that recently. So those are, those are ways to build up data models on the cloud side that interact with the data on your device, and so your device becomes a first-class managed object. In fact, I think in the public GitHub repo, I did see device methods. Yes, so that, device, that's live. So device methods are the notion that you have an object over here that you can invoke a method on that goes all the way to your device, executes, and comes back with a return that looks synchronous from the programming model. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it may or may not actually be, but it, it behaves the way you would anticipate it. So from the cloud side, from IoT Hub, the next step out is what we talk about as the protocol adapter layer. And you're all probably, if you've, if you've been in this business longer than five minutes, aware of the fact that everybody has their own protocol on the wire to carry data and do what they want to do. And everybody's protocol is the best one out there. So don't get into the trap of arguing. Just write an adapter. <laughs> so historically speaking, our protocol of choice has been AMQP. Um, we also now support MQTT as a first class citizen from protocol support. So over time, initially we had an MQTT to AMQP adapter. We now host that natively so that we can do uh, AMQP and MQTT to devices natively without another adapter layer. Um, but you can imagine any number of other protocol adapters. They could, they could be built for anything. And in fact, um, this is how you bring in legacy devices where you can't change the protocol on the device. That is one way to bring them in. Um, another block you'll see up here is a thing we call the field gateway. So the notion of proximal networking is important. If you put a bunch of sensors out in an in environment that's disconnected or lightly connected, or in a place where you put a whole bunch of sensors that have short range networking, you can put a field gateway, think of it as like a Wi-Fi router in your house, out with them that can communicate to the sensors and then it can communicate to the cloud. That's what we think of as a field gateway. 
Um, it can be either necessary for networking infrastructure reasons or because of logical architecture, that it makes more sense to design a system that way. Um, and then from there on out, you have uh, devices that are connected into your IoT infrastructure. And the point I want to make before I leave this slide, which I am anxious to do, uh, is that everything that we provide technology-wise that's outside of the IoT hub today is available on GitHub. It's all MIT licensed. So the, the protocol gateways that we have out there, the field gateway SDK that we have out there, and all of the client SDKs, be them in C, Java, C Sharp, and some mm. other set of languages yeah. I've lost track of, they are all available and people can play with them today without having to talk to us at all. And we're also expanding it too, like for the Gateway SDK, uh, having support for OPC UA, uh, which is really great uh, for connecting legacy devices and Industry 4.0. So it's something to think about as well if you're really trying to take your legacy devices mostly on the manufacturing floor and connecting them to the cloud. That's actually an interesting point. I'm going to skip off that uh, slide, but I wanted to point out that when I came from outside of the product team to the product team at Microsoft, one of my biggest axes to grind was why they weren't, why the IoT product team wasn't paying more attention to what I care about, which is innovation and product discovery. And then I was very nicely informed from outside of the company, actually that our IoT uh, announcement, sort of when we, be, went pro, when we went live with our IoT solution, we went live at Hanover Massey, which is the largest manufacturing conference mm -hmm. that occurs. And we went live with the ability to announce that every device on the show floor was capable of connecting to Azure IoT because we had put in the effort to build the gateways to make it happen and gave them away, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that on day one, we lit up 38,000 devices made me realize we might have made a strategic investment that made sense. And so I had little criticism after that. <laughs> so here's the things that you can do in building your own IoT solution. I'm going to burn through a bunch of this stuff. But essentially, you can process your data in real time. You can build dashboards. Uh, get smart with Azure Machine Learning, because if you don't have Azure Machine Learning, you can't be, no, wait, that's a joke. Um, Storing data for later analysis, all sorts of other stuff. And then we also have uh, uh, Azure Functions for this new fancy thing that everyone talks about, serverless computing, which is really not serverless because they run somewhere, but it's a great buzzword. Um, this is what IoT talks about, our, our IoT hub. Since I talked about it, I'm going to skip over this. Um, one thing that we do have that I think is interesting, and if you're in the space and you're going, I don't know what device I want, I don't know what capabilities I need. I don't really understand all this stuff that's out there when it comes to hardware. We have this thing called the, the device catalog that we host. It's catalog.azureiotsuite.com. You can actually, you can't see it over here, but this says industry device type, tested consent, compatible sensors, built-in sensors, OS, connectivity, hardware, interfaces, manufacturers, cloud protocol, geo availability. So every potential sort of aspect of the device that you might want to understand, we have a way to pivot on that data and look at the various devices that we've interacted with or that we know, know of. I'm going to say this because it comes up on a later slide, but one of the key values that we bring to the conversation is a history of working with a very large partner ecosystem. Putting something together like this for us is actually pretty straightforward. Putting this together, if you have to go sign 99 two-way NDAs just to get access to the spec sheet is a little bit cumbersome for a single person or a single entity. So this is something we can offer to the community that is a huge value. And one thing I would want to point out is that Azure works on all platforms, as Ivan has said, and this device catalog really highlights that, you know, if you wanted to work on Windows 10 IoT Core, that's great, but we also have all these other devices and partnerships, you know, that uses WinRiver, Yocto, uh, or no operating system at all. So we want to really make sure that people know that it's not just Windows, that it's all different platforms that we're contributing to and, and wanting to help out with. Yeah, actually, you'll notice that. Um, what, which computer did you bring? So I brought <laughs> one of us brought a Windows computer, but the one we're demoing from isn't a Windows computer because that's not the one I brought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, golly, I wasn't ready for demo yet. I hadn't teed it up in my brain. 
All right, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of a tour. And by tour, what I mean is I am hoping everything works the way I expect it's going to. This is my desktop. That's a trout, in case anyone's wondering. I get that question a lot. I have to find the right window. So I am going to show you a couple of interesting things. So what you'll see here, uh, if you could see, and it doesn't get bigger on that way. How do I make it bigger? Um, I'm going to point it out, and it's going to be a pain. But what you see here is this is a top-level directory in my home directory called ESP. So what I've done, which is a pretty straightforward exercise, is I have literally followed the ESP32 uh, directions off their GitHub page. Their development environment is called ESP-IDF. And so I've created an ESP directory. I've checked out the ESP-IDF project from GitHub. I downloaded the Extensa toolset, so Tensilica is the company that actually maps out all the logic for the, core, the, the processor. They provide a tool chain called the Extensa tool chain. It's a GCC derivative for cross-compiling for their hardware. Um, so you can see that that's installed here, Extensa ESP32 ELF. I put it in my path so that I could find the compiler, right? So now I have this ESP IDF and Extensa toolkit. And the extent of the configuration was essentially, whoops, I can type, and I can make this one bigger. You'll notice I have this IDF path set. So I had to set an environment variable to find the IDF path, pretty straightforward. And then in my path, I had to add the extensive tools, the bin to the tools, literally, that was what I had to do to get started. Now, I've plugged in an ESP32 into my machine, into my USB port, and it is currently running as the slab USB UART device. What you see here, actually, I'm going to start over so that you can see it. From I am going to go get bigger so you can see. So this is that ESP IDF. That's not big enough for the people in the back. Tell me when. Yep. I have my can't see very well today because so, I'm tired. So. so this is the ESP IDF path. If you look at the README, it'll tell you exactly the same thing as what I just did. Basically, uh, check it out and do stuff. Now, they have a make system set up that should look really familiar if you've ever built the Linux kernel in the old days. I don't know how it is today. I haven't done it in the last n years where n is larger than I'm going to admit. But if I go to the examples directory, Here's a, some simple examples, right? Here's a hello world example. So if I sit here in the hello world directory and I say make menu config, oh, I wonder how big I have to go. It just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Yeah, I never, it always bites me somehow. There. So it goes through this very handy little configuration menu. Um, if you look at this, the first option is the SDK. 
So it's going to tell me that it's found the, the extensive compiler and it's using Python 2. I can do bootloader config, which is basically how verbose do I want the system to run. In the under security, you can see I can, I can actually select enable secure boot and enable flash encryption. It says read docs first because once you do this, you can't actually go back through the development cycle without more work. So they don't want you to be surprised as an engineer that you've made a choice that is, makes your life harder. Serial flasher config, this is where I can tell it things like, that's not where it is. I'm going to go here. I'm going to select this. I'm going to not go there. I'm going to go here and put it there. It's, it sets itself to a reasonable baud rate, compresses things when it goes up. They have a couple of tools. One is make monitor, which I'm going to show you, which is really handy in the development. I'm going to save it just to be pedantic because save your work often. Something will blow up. You can choose how you want the partition table on the ESP32 to work. It has a couple of out-of-the-box solutions. One is a single app with no over-the-air support. And the other one is you can have a, uh, a factory-based app with two over-the-air segments defined so that you can then do over-the-air updates. Um, I'm going to leave it like it is for now because the demo is going to change some stuff later. Um, a bunch of optimization uh, stuff gets done if you go to release, but we want to see all the stuff come out when we build it. And then in component config, this is where you start getting into the meat of what's included in the, in the app that you're going to build, right? So you can turn Bluetooth on and off, first thing to know. That way, if you're doing Wi-Fi and you don't want to use the power, just leave the Bluetooth off. Under the ESP32 specific commands, or, or configuration, you'll notice a couple of things. One is you can select the CPU frequency, which will affect your power consumption. The choices are 80, 160, and 240. It comes out of the box at 240. You can reserve memory for two cores. The, the ESP32 actually has two cores inside the, the chip, and you can reserve memory for both. But also down lower, you can say, if I can find it, maybe it's not here. Oh, it's on a previous setting, I think. No, it's going to be here somewhere. I'm missing it. Somewhere there is an option to say, lock the app to a single core. So then you don't actually need both enabled, and you can save resources. But you can see there's a bunch of other configs. This is the ultra low, pro low power processor that is e available to run even when you are in sleep mode. But you have to program it with assembly, and their tooling isn't filled out yet, so I never enable that. It's just not worth the work right now. Uh, a, bunch of a bunch of other stuff. Real-time clock source. So you'll notice there's no clock, which will come up later in my demo. I'm turning Wi-Fi on. This is the one, under, free R un under RTOS. I can say run, this, run the RTOS uh, program only, uh, only on the first core. So if I allocate memory for both and lock it to the first core, I'm wasting memory. If I, al if I don't allocate memory for both and I run it on one, I've kind of got the optimal resource stuff going on. Then there's a bunch of other config. Does that have effect on the Wi-Fi support system? Um, I haven't experienced any, but my experience is anecdotal. I haven't tested, so I'm not sure. That door doesn't like to be opened, by the way. Um, bunch of other interesting things. One of them uh, being, where's the debug stuff? I think it's under here. There is an interesting debug behavior that they support where you can dump, you can have the ESP32 when it has a, a problem dump its core. In one mode, you can dump the core to flash memory. And in another mode, it'll actually uh, in ASCII encode the core and dump it over the serial port so that you can grab it. And they have tools for then converting it back to a core to analyze on your desktop, which I think is kind of handy. Anyway, I'm going to save this, because I think that I haven't made any changes that are going to kill me. You never know. And I'm going to say make. For now, I'll just say make just for fun to show you. So it's building all of its various pieces. 
And it's pretty quick and simple and straightforward, nothing magical going on, other than it's using the cross compiler to target. Five minutes. Yes, yes, it is. There are cross compilers for most of the platforms, if not all of them. At least those three. It's a GCC port, yeah, for the. So now it's built. You'll see it says you can run make flash. I'm going to run a couple of commands at the same time. I'm going to run make flash and monitor. So now it's going to actually flash to the device over the serial port, because I pre-configured that all in the menu. And once it flashes, it's going to invoke the reset on the board and open a serial port monitor so that we can actually see it as it goes by, all, all the same sort of command. This is compared to the, and so there you go. Now it started, and you can see it said, hello world. And then it'll reboot again. And there's the, the output. So this is about the most amazing improvement in development over what we did with the ESP8266 that you can imagine. That was not fun to program. I mean, it was fun to program. It was high effort. This is fun and low effort. Um, we have Azure IoT using MQTT running on the ESP8266. Um, we have it compiling and mostly running here, which is, explains why I'm tired for this talk. Um, the one place that we, the one thing we have left to connect, uh, which I can show you actually for fun. Let's go now to ESP, ESP IDF, Azure. So I'll take you through what I did here really quickly. Merging two make environments. So Azure IoT, C99 library, we use CMake. This is clearly not using CMake, it's using component make files and platform make files in a, in a make, make infrastructure. So if I go into components, which is where it looks for default by, for subcomponents it wants to build, you can see I have an Azure IoT SDK in C. If I go in here, you'll see I built a component make file for the IoT SDK. It has all of the stuff that you need to build. I have pulled out a subset of all the various libraries because I don't need all of them. I don't need AMQP, I don't need HTTP and WebSockets. I just want the MQTT layer. I'm gonna get the, I'm running out of time sign. So if I do make, and I'm just gonna go fast here, make flash monitor, actually I have to go up here. Whoop, I can spell, I promise. So I, I, have, I built it and there have been no changes, so now it's flashing, reflashing. This will take about a minute and a half, two minutes because it's a fairly large binary. There's not a lot of optimization in the ESP32 uh, build system, so there's a ton of object files that are still linked in and moved to the ESP32 even though they're not necessarily in use. Um, there's a big opportunity in our community to come up with a single set of reliable object, implement, object file implementations for things like around security that everybody doesn't have to include their own TLS layer every time. So here I am, I'm launching, you can see, I'm, uh, there you, you can't see it because it went by too fast, but what you can see, I've exited, uh, what you'll see here, it fires up. One of the first things that you see right here, which is interesting, is we're on, the, we're on the LF events channel Wi-Fi, we got our IP address, and I invoke an SNTP server to get local time, because if I don't set my local time right, generating credentials sucks. <laughs> so I set my local time, and I print out the Portland time and Shanghai, because that's where Espressive, so I thought it was kind of cute. And then I've, in, I've initialized the IoT SDK, and I've created the, the client, and I've set the message callback, which means I'm registering for when I get an MQTT message from the cloud, and I've posted an asynchronous message to go to the cloud. And then in the background, when my work loop happens, you'll see I'm trying to connect to this endpoint, which is my MQTT endpoint, 
And the first thing that happens is it fails. And I can tell you from our experience with the 8266 that this failure is that I did not tell it what client certificate to provide when it did the socket with the TLS connection. So the cloud side is saying, it's really nice you want to talk to me, but I don't know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's awesome. where we are on the demo. But you can see we've got a whole bunch of stuff built. We've, we're, we'll share this on GitHub. It'll be freely available for anyone who wants to do it. Um, we have really good interactions with Espressif and others. And if you have questions, now is probably your time. Because if I talk anymore, he's going to give me the I yeah, have we, we no got... time. Look, he's going to zero. Stop. Oh, we got, we got, I got red. the big red stop. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>